Hello everybody, today I'm going to be doing a review of Before I Let Go by Marika Nenkamp. I received this book from NetGalley in exchange for honest review. This is the fourth time I'm recording this video because I wasn't happy with the first two times and then the third time I was pretty happy with it but then I realized I wasn't in focus for any of the video and now it's been several months since I've read the book and filmed those first three attempts of the review so we're gonna try again today and hope it goes okay. This is about two best friends, Corey and Kyra, who have grown up together in the town of Lost Creek, Alaska. They've been inseparable their whole lives, but then Corey's mother gets a new job in Canada, so Corey moves to Canada with her mother, but before she leaves, she makes Kyra promise to wait for her to return to Lost Creek because Kyra has bipolar disorder and she just wants to make sure that Kyra is going to still be there and be okay when Corey returns. And then a week before Corey is set to go back to Lost Creek to visit, she gets a phone call saying that Kyra has died. Everybody is saying that Kyra died by suicide. She walked off onto a frozen lake and fell through the ice and drowned. Corey doesn't believe that for several reasons. She thinks something more is going on and when she returns to the town of Lost Creek everybody's acting real weird and she's trying to figure out what actually happened to Kyra. First I'm gonna go over a few things that had like really really good points to them and then also some bad points to them. The first bit is when we first start off there is a little paragraph that's pretty much how the town of Lost Creek was found. It kind of reads like a fable or a fairy tale. It's really pretty the way it's written. And I liked in there that it mentions colonialism, it mentions the fact that the land that these white people founded is stolen land, it's not actually their land. I'm like, yes, way to go. Mention colonialism. Mention the fact that this land belonged to Alaska Natives and other people before you. Also, Kyra is a storyteller. She loves to collect stories just like her grandfather did, but her grandfather didn't really care about the people he was collecting those stories from and just used those stories for his own purposes, whereas Kyra wants to be more aware, culturally aware, and making sure that she tells those stories in the way they're supposed to be told and that she pretty much has permission from Alaska Natives and Native American people and just other people to tell those stories. So this is all really great. I'm glad that the author is very aware of colonialism and the power structures between white people and Native Americans, but there is not one single Alaska Native character in here. Not a one. Actually, pretty much everybody in this book is white. We have a little small town set in Alaska of white people. There are two characters of color, a father and a son, who have just recently moved there. They are Indian, but that's it. There's no Native Americans. There's no Alaska Natives. Why are there no Alaska Natives in your book set in Alaska, which mentions colonialism? And racism towards Alaska Natives but doesn't actually have Alaska Native characters. I don't, I don't get it. Next we have the representation around Kyra's bipolar disorder. I myself am not bipolar so take everything I say with a grain of salt. There were many things that seemed very good about this representation like fact-wise as far as I'm aware it seemed pretty accurate to bipolar disorder. There was also pretty pro taking medication for mental illness and pro getting therapy and getting help, seeking help for mental illness. Things I'm always really happy to see in teen books and any book really ever. But overall and with the ending of this book and when you find out what happened to Kyra, which I'll get into in a more spoilery section of this video, but when you really find out the mystery behind how she died, I just felt really hopeless at the end of this book. I didn't feel good. Like I said, I don't have bipolar disorder, but I do have mental illness. I have anxiety. And just like reading about this character who wasn't accepted by her town like ever, and then like she is at one point like you find out why she was really accepted and then what happened to her and it's just very hopeless and bleak. It's a very bleak picture of what somebody with mental illness will live and like I understand there will be people like depending on the circumstances who might have like a harder time with mental illness and like finding acceptance and getting treatment but I just like I don't know I want people with mental illness and bipolar disorder to have a happier something with a little bit more hope in it. And then I did read on Twitter that the author really just didn't want this to be inspiration porn. And like, I understand that not wanting somebody who has mental illness or a disability to just become inspiration porn to other people. But I almost feel like she went too far in the other direction of like, if you have over here, it's inspiration porn. Over here is like, there's no hope for you as somebody with mental illness. And that's where she went with this book. That's how I felt by the end of the book. Like, I was just like, oh, wow. Okay. I guess this is what it's like to live in Alaska with mental illness. There's no happiness or joy in your life, apparently. Mm. And the next thing with both good points and bad points is the queer representation. Kyra is pansexual and Corey is asexual. I really liked that we get pansexual on the page. There's, I feel like, less pansexual characters in teen fiction right now. There's quite a few bisexual, but pansexual and just like any other type of multisexual outside of bisexual, there's a little bit less representation. So that was really great. For the ace representation, now it is on voices. But I've also seen when voices reviews 
that felt the same way that I kind of feel about it is that it really seems to make the distinction between being asexual and aromantic like there's not really a distinction here at all it seems very much like if you don't have romantic feelings for somebody you're asexual like it just mentions asexual but like for me as somebody who is on the arrow spectrum it felt more like she might have been aromantic or maybe she was both arrow ace but it just wasn't described in a way that was very clear and I was that person who didn't think I could be on the arrow spectrum for a really really long time because I wasn't asexual and I wasn't on the ace spectrum and it took very many years for me to realize like oh I can be allosexual and also demi-romantic. So I really like books to be more clear on that. And I understand at some point, to some extent here, that Corey herself is still figuring it out and that she probably at this time maybe doesn't realize there's a difference between romantic orientation and sexual orientation. And like, I get that, that's a really real experience. But if you don't put it in your book that there's a difference between romantic orientation and sexual orientation, then like more people aren't going to be aware that there's a difference like you can say yes that's like a real experience I'm like but you know a way you can help that not be a real experience so not be not be a real experience but like how you can help educate people is putting it in your book that there is a difference between those two things and also it just doesn't make sense because the reason they figure out the terms pansexual and asexual is because kyra googles it and i'm like okay in this day and age if somebody's going to be googling different sexualities and it comes up with asexual i feel like Probably you would also find a romantic and those terms. I mean, I could be wrong. I could Google it myself and see what happens. But I feel like it's gotten to the point, for the most part, if you're trying to Google something like that, you'd get those both those terms and like the difference between them. So I just really want things to be more clear on the difference between asexuality and aromanticism and to just make it so people aren't going to think you have to be both you can be just one or the other. Now we're going to move on to my general complaints before we get to my Alaskan specific complaints. General complaints. This book tries to create atmosphere by having these weird things happen throughout the book that have no explanation. Like as I was reading this book and I've also seen this in other reviews, it makes it seem like there's going to be a paranormal element to this story. There's not. So all these weird things that happen, there's no explanation for them. Like I'm assuming like there was a lot of things about flowers popping up. Probably random people put those flowers, those pots. Like it doesn't make sense why they would do that. But I guess that's the only explanation because all the paranormal other elements like her hearing voices, they're, they're nothing, no explanation. She hears voices and yeah. Also this book tried to create atmosphere by having all the other characters be really cryptic and hold back information from our main character for absolutely no reason. And I hated it so much. It's one of my personal pet peeves when try to create atmosphere in a book. I hate it. I hate when people are withholding information for no reason. It's just a very obvious technique so that the reader isn't aware of things. But I feel like you can do better. There must be a better way. Um, so there's an instance where Corey is first arriving to Lost Creek and one of the townspeople comes and picks her up and Corey's asking her questions and Kyra's just like, you'll see, you'll see. And that's it. I'm like, why? Why do you have to say you'll see? Just explain stuff. There's no reason for you to not to. Also, they said the town name Lost Creek or just Lost so many times, especially in the first half, or maybe it was just by the second half, I got used to seeing Lost Creek and Lost over and over again, but they never just refer to it as the town or my town or anything. It's always Lost or Lost Creek over and over and over again. My last general grievance with this book is the way it is told, it's formatted. Most of it is told through present day with Corey trying to figure out what's happening and also through flashbacks of Corey and Kyra growing up together. And every once in a while, we also get letters that Corey or Kyra had sent to each other. But then about halfway through the book, it introduces a completely new format to tell the story. And that's through what kind of feels like a screenplay or a play kind of format. I don't know if there's really a difference between those two. And like, I didn't hate them. But it was just weird to have them come only halfway through a book. I would figure if you're going to do something like that, you do it from the very beginning. It doesn't make sense to introduce those just halfway through the book. Also, they do kind of develop, create a barrier between me as a reader and the character's feelings because you're no longer in the character's head. You're no longer in Corey's head knowing what she's thinking or during those scenes. And there was definitely one scene where I was like, I really like to know what Corey's thinking right now. But you don't get to know that in a screenplay format. And yeah, it was just weird. Now we're going to move on to the part about all the things I hated about the way Alaska was presented in this book. If you are not aware, 
I live in Alaska. I grew up in Alaska. I'm pretty familiar with Alaska. This did not feel like Alaska at all to me. I'm sure there'll be people who are from Alaska who would disagree with me. Uh, but yeah, just everything she described about Alaska felt wrong. There were some things where I was like, okay, I can see you did a little research here. Happy for that. But the general like feeling atmosphere of Alaska wasn't present. And then there was just like details that were just completely wrong. The first thing that gave me a little hint that I wasn't gonna like the way Alaska was talked about in this book or just that it was gonna be wrong is when Corey is first arriving back to Lost Creek and she has just landed and her pilot says, look out, things in Lost Creek aren't what they always seem to be. And now if he had just said that, if that's where this exchange had ended or the whole scene had ended, I could see that kind of making sense because since Corey has left Lost Creek, uh, the town has gone a little weird for reasons. Um, but it's gone a little weird and I can see that maybe he's been there a couple times since the town has gone weird and now he's like trying to warn her like, hey, things are weird here. But after he says, things aren't always what they seem in Lost Creek, uh, Corey thinks to herself, like in her head, internal monologue, is like, ah, uh, we're all used to those kind of comments here in Lost Creek. Nobody really understands our close-knit community. Now, Alaska is pretty much made up of small towns and villages. We have three larger cities, but for the most part, it's all really small towns. Um, I feel like anybody who grew up in Alaska is not gonna be weirded out by a close-knit community. And then I did talk to all my friends and my brother and like multiple people about this book because I complained about it a lot. And as one of my friends pointed out, she pointed out that a bush pilot, somebody whose job it is to fly around small towns in Alaska is not gonna be weirded out by a close-knit community in a small Alaskan town. It's just not a comment they would make. It's weird. And then there's a line where Corey walks outside, looks up into the sky, realizes it's not snowing and says, huh, it's weird that it's not snowing in winter it does not snow every day in Alaska in the winter, not even close. Like I've talked to multiple of my friends here and we're like, no, that's not how Alaska works in the winter. Here's a fun fact. When it gets too cold, it stops snowing. And like technically it can snow when it gets really cold, but usually it doesn't. It needs to be at least somewhat warm by Alaskan winter standards for it to snow, which is usually in the winter, how I tell if it's kind of warm out by once again, Alaskan winter standards. If I walk outside and it's snowing, I'm like, ah, it must be a reasonable temperature outside. But this is Alaska and it's the winter. And yes, global warming is a thing. And we've had much, much more mild winters than compared to when I was a kid, but it's still cold, real, real cold, a good portion of the winter, which means it's not snowing because it does not snow every day in Alaska. I cannot begin to tell you how much that line has bugged me since I read this book. It's been months and sometimes I think about it and I just get annoyed all over again. It does not snow every day in Alaska. It is not a weird thing for it to not snow in the winter. It's not, it's really, really not. And this next thing is me being maybe a little bit too picky, but I'm just real annoyed at this point. And that is, there's a flashback scene between Corey and Kyra and they're staring at the Northern Lights and the Northern Lights are red. Now, obviously the Northern Lights can be red. I'm sure all of you have seen pictures of the really beautiful red Northern Lights and Corey, who is interested in astronomy and how the sky works, even goes into the science behind Northern Lights and why they're usually more commonly green than red, why the red ones are so rare. So obviously the author is aware that red Northern Lights are rare and not something you're gonna see commonly. Like I've lived in Alaska for, you know, pretty much 25 out of my 26 years of life. And I've seen the Northern Lights every year, several times a year during the winter when it's dark enough to see them. And let me tell you how many times I've seen the red Northern Lights. I don't even know if I've seen the Northern Lights be red, possibly when I was younger, I don't remember. But that's, that's the kind of rarity the red Northern Lights are. Oh, once again, obviously the author's aware that red Northern Lights are rare, but yet she still decided to make her one scene with the Northern Lights, make them be red. They couldn't just be green. Like I assure you, the green Northern Lights are still very, very pretty. And it's just a thing in books set in Alaska by non-Alaskan authors that the, red, the Northern Lights are always red. And I don't know why that is. If all these other authors think they're really common or people are just like, ah, oh, these are prettier versions. I don't know. It's just like a personal pet peeve of mine because I'm so tired of seeing it in books from non-Alaskan authors. You can just make your Northern Lights green. It's fine. I'm going to move into spoilers about the ending in a second, but first I want to talk about the things I did like about this book because I gave this book two stars. So there must be something I liked about this book. Now it's been several months and I don't really know what I liked about the book besides the fact that like I was never bored while reading it. I think I read it in one setting, but I read a lot of books in one setting. So at this point, it doesn't mean anything. So yeah, I wasn't bored while reading it. I kind of wanted to know the answer, but then the answer was so horrible. 
because I didn't want to know the answer anymore and I kind of wanted to erase this book from my mind. So I don't know. It's like a 1.5 two stars, I guess, for not being boring. That's all I can say about that. I'm going to move into spoilers um, about, once again, it has completely to do with the mental illness rep in this book and also the way Alaska is depicted in this book and how much I really hate the ending and the how Kyra died. Uh, it's horrible and I, I don't like it. But if you don't want to be spoiled, click away and let's go into the spoilers. For those who haven't read the book but didn't care about spoilers, I'm going to give you a little context around Kyra's death, which is that when she was in one of her manic phases of her bipolar disorder, she would paint. Not necessarily because she loves painting, but just because that was one of the ways for her to like work off the energy that was a way that was safe for her and for the people around her, so she paints. And after Corey leaves, Kyra paints something and the people start thinking she's being able to tell the future with her paintings and they think all of her paintings are going to show how Lost Creek is going to like revive itself and become a better place because right now it's kind of dying. It's Kyra's really struggling with her bipolar disorder and she really wants to go to Fairbanks to get therapy there and to just become better, to feel better. Um, but the town won't let her. They want her to stay. Even though they have rejected her since she got her bipolar disorder diagnosis, now all of a sudden she is part of Lost Creek and they cannot survive or something without her. So when she tries to run away, when she tries to run to the airport and just like hopefully catch a plane to Fairbanks, they all like trap her on this frozen lake and they watch her drown. She breaks through the ice and she drowns because to them she is worth more dead but like technically still in Lost Creek than she is somewhere else happier. And it's just a really horrible feeling and like I understand the book is presenting this obviously as a bad thing like all the townspeople are wrong for what they did but it's still really horrible this whole like idea that your whole town that's rejected you your whole life is then going to watch you die like they're literally just gonna watch you drown and do nothing to help and part of me like I don't necessarily think the author was trying to say this or was even thinking it but to me it feels like what a non-Alaskan author thinks happens in Alaska when it gets dark 24 7 in the winter is that we all go crazy and we just let people die and drown and I kind of feel like that's what people are taking away from this book without maybe them realizing it but I've read reviews where people are like oh I loved the creepy Alaskan setting there or something similar to that and you can see that people are now associating Alaska with like creepy or just like weirdness and it's just like yeah Alaska is a little different and definitely lots of people suffer from seasonal affective disorder and depression and like winters can be really really hard I've been struggling with winters really bad the past two years, but we don't all go crazy and watch somebody drown and watch some die. That's, that's not how it works in Alaska. Also, there's the whole plot hole of how she fell through the ice because from the very beginning, Corey didn't believe that Kyra just like fell through the ice because at this point in the winter, the ice is going to be too thick for somebody to just fall through, which is why she was kind of thinking Kyra had been murdered, which like Kyra was murdered. But there's nothing about one of the townspeople like weakening the ice in any way for her to have fallen through the ice. So it's still a plot hole. She just falls through ice that was supposed to be too thick for her to have fallen through at this point in the winter. So yeah, there's that plot hole and there's the Alaskan people are crazy in the winter and we're going to kill somebody. And if you live in Alaska and you have mental illness and you live in a small part of Alaska, your whole town's going to reject you and then they're going to kill you. That's what this feels like. And I know the author's not trying to say that, but that doesn't stop me from feeling like what was presented in this book was that. And it was just a really horrible feeling. Wow, I'm really wanting to give this book one star right now. I don't recommend this book, which is sad. I'd really love to recommend books with queer representation and mental illness representation in a book set in Alaska. But we don't have a whole lot of those. But I just don't trust people from outside Alaska to write books set in Alaska. It's not working for me ever. And I keep giving people chances for that. And they're not doing good at all. Well, let me know if you read this book. Uh, hopefully you didn't feel so angry about it as me. I don't want people to walk away from these books that I like hate and feel really badly about. I don't want them walking away with those bad feelings because that doesn't feel good. If I know how I feel, I don't want other people to feel that way. But I also wonder sometimes if I'm overreacting. I don't feel like I am, honestly, but I do wonder if other people feel like I'm overreacting. I don't know. Let me know your feelings. I'll see you all next time. Bye.